let's begin with some clarifications of the terms we'll need. First, evidence. In everyday contexts, we think of evidence as physical things, like DNA tests or documents. But these things can only provide information if we have some sort of mental access to them. We have to be aware of them. So this is why philosophers tend to use evidence to refer to the information which your mind grasps about the thing, rather than to the thing itself. There are two different forms which evidence might take. One form is what philosophers call seemings. A seeming is a perceptual experience or a memory, such as seeming or remem seeing or remembering seeing a fingerprint. The second form of evidence is what you believe. So if you believe that a testifying witness is reliable, then this belief is part of your evidence for believing what that witness says. The difference between seemings and beliefs is this. A seeming is just an appearance, which you may or may not think is accurate. So a mirage is an example of a seeming which you don't think is accurate most of the time. A belief, on the other hand, is something you are committed to. You think it describes the world the way it is. And this gives a certain hierarchy to our evidence. Seemings tend to come first, and when we form judgments about them, about whether they're veridical, we get further beliefs, and these further beliefs can be themselves the basis for yet more beliefs. So this is what evidence is. But what's it for? Evidence is for trying to figure out what's true. This is what an evidence-weighting policy helps us do. An evidence-weighting policy can't, of course, guarantee a true belief, because evidence might be misleading. Just think of the mirage. But it should do the best it can. And it should do this for both parties to a disagreement. That is, an evidence-weighting policy should work to uphold somebody who starts off with a true belief, but it should also nudge somebody who starts with a false belief towards the truth, or at least not farther away from it than they were already. This will help us resolve a disagreement. So one of the ways in which an evidence-weighting policy has to do this is by dealing with bias. To see how it might do this, we have to look a little bit more closely at biases themselves. So what is a bias? It's a tendency to associate concepts with each other, such as the concept dog and danger. When we have an association like this, we're disposed to form certain beliefs. For example, if we come across a dog, we'll tend to believe that it's dangerous. Sometimes, biases just cause us to form these beliefs without any evidence at all. But other times, they affect the beliefs that we form on the basis of evidence itself. How? Well, first, we saw in the previous segment that they affect the way that we weight our evidence. So whether you think Sam swerved her car for a good reason or just because she's reckless depends partly on whether you are biased for or against her. But second, biases can get into the very content of our evidence itself. How can they do this? Well, first, they can affect our seemings our experiences and memories. So suppose I associate dishonesty with philosophy lecturers. Then, whenever I meet any particular philosophy lecturer, I'll be disposed to perceive her as a dishonest person. My perception will be colored by a sense of dishonesty. And the same goes for memories. When I remember meeting some person who's wearing blue, I might build a sense of dishonesty into it, even if it wasn't there to begin with. From here, we can easily see how bias might get into our belief evidence, too. For when we have a seeming, we're naturally inclined to believe that things are as it represents them. Um, so I'll be inclined to believe that a philosophy lecturer really is dishonest because I perceive her that way, and I have an association between dishonesty and philosophy lecturers. This is where an evidence-weighting policy comes in. It can't change my natural tendency to weight evidence, but it can tell me that that tendency is wrong. Similarly, an evidence-weighting policy cannot uh, take the biases out of my seemings, but it can affect how I form beliefs on the basis of those seemings. It can say, for example, that you shouldn't always automatically form the beliefs that your seemings suggest. But an evidence-weighting policy has to be careful here, for it can't just say, don't form beliefs on the basis of biased seemings. The reason is that not all biases are bad. Our brains form biases 
because biases in turn help us form beliefs quickly when we need to, then often these beliefs are true. So if we associate umbrellas and rain, for example, we'll automatically form a true belief when we see rain that we should bring an umbrella. We won't need to think about it. So biases are like rules of thumb for our brains. But just like any rule of thumb, biases are blunt instruments. They can lead people astray too, including, in this case, to believing falsehoods. Why? Because biases aren't always responsive to the facts. Sometimes they come about because of our culture, emotions, our feelings of identifying with our community, or simply from what we always grew up believing. But this isn't all. Even biases that are responsive to the facts can sometimes lead us astray. That is, they can yield what I'm going to call false positive beliefs. Beliefs that are caused by bias and that are false even though we think that they're true. For example, people are programmed to associate motion with other people. So uh, often when we hear a creaking door, we'll believe that someone's there. And often we'll be right, but sometimes we'll be wrong. It might just be a draft. So let me introduce some more terminology. When a bias associates two things that really are often associated, I'll call it a roughly reliable bias. Roughly, because it can sometimes tempt us to form false positive beliefs too. And when a bias associates two things that aren't often associated, I'll call it an unreliable bias. Now let's apply these considerations to religious disagreements. I want to focus on two kinds of concepts that we can have biases about. First, there are religious concepts. For example, atheist, Muslim, Jew, Catholic, liberal, fundamentalist. Second, there are concepts about epistemology, that is about truth, falsehood, or intellectual abilities. For example, we have the concepts of true, false, closed-minded, spiritually blind, enlightened, revealed by God. So it's very easy, indeed it's natural, for people to have biases which associate religious concepts on the one hand with epistemological concepts on the other. And this means that we can very easily and very automatically discredit another person or view simply because they disagree with us about religion. And it also means that we can think that our own evidence is much better than it actually is, simply because we strongly associate our own view or our own community with truth, rightness, or virtue. So whether religious and epistemological biases are roughly reliable or unreliable, we can see how they can pose a problem in resolving religious disagreements. They'll dispose us to being entrenched in our own view and to not being ready to listen to someone else's. So this is the situation which an evidence-weighting policy has to negotiate if it's going to help us resolve religious disagreements. It has to de-emphasize unreliable biases in our evidence, but it also has to let roughly reliable ones do their important cognitive work, at the same time protecting us from false positive beliefs. So this is going to be a tricky balance, and no evidence-weighting policy can get it perfectly right all the time, but it should, be, it, it should be designed so as to do the best that it can. With all this in mind, I look at some evidence-weighting policies for beliefs about religion. I'll measure them on the basis of how well they meet the following constraint, which just summarizes what I've said so far. I'm calling it the resolution constraint. So an evidence-weighting policy for beliefs about religious matters must negotiate the doxastic effects of bias, that is, the effects on our beliefs, in a way which promotes the resolution of religious disagreements.